All right then, I'm gonna try and keep this intro as short as possible because today we have so much cool stuff to get through. But I'm sure you're pretty confused right now, so I'll give you a very quick rundown of the situation. Simply put, I am currently in possession of the Heian Era flashbacks. As you have probably figured out by now though, they are not official chapters written by Gege. It's very clear that we are not getting Heian Era flashbacks anytime soon or ever. So I got bored of waiting and decided to write them myself. Now this video will hopefully be the first part of a series, so I haven't written the entire Heian era, only the bits that people want to see the most. This video will cover Sukuna's birth and childhood, how Sukuna met Arame, how Kenjaku got the soul of Sukuna's twin, and finally how Kenjaku convinced Sukuna to take part in the culling games. This video has been in the making for a long time, and I go into great depth with each of these stories, as well as making sure to stay on theme and keep everybody in character. This genuinely may be the closest thing we ever get to a Heian era flashback, so I think you guys will really enjoy it. Also, if this video can get 2k likes, I will turn this into a series and make it part two. Anyway, let's get right into it. To begin our journey, allow me to take you all the way back to the Nara era, which is actually before the Heian era. It was around the year 750 when the immortal sorceress Tengen, creator of Japan's pure barriers, had fallen pregnant. And yes, you can probably see where I'm going with this, and some of you may not like the sound of it, but please just trust the process because I think I have cooked. Anyway, Tengen had fallen pregnant with twins, however, she was completely unaware of this fact for a very long time. And the reason for this is all due to the nature of her immortality technique. From the moment the twins were conceived, they were subject to the effects of Tengen's immortality technique due to still being a physical part of her. Similar to how Jujutsu considers twins one and the same, it also views a fetus and a mother in much the same way. As a result, the physical development of the twins was slowed massively and the pregnancy was prolonged far beyond the normal nine months. In fact, this pregnancy lasted around 223 years and Tengen only became aware of it part of the way through the Heian era. Over those two long centuries, the twins were very slowly growing, as well as being constantly shrouded in Tengen's own cursed energy. Similar to how Yuji Itadori soaked up Sukuna's cursed energy from being his vessel, the twins had gained an immense amount of cursed energy each over the years. Now even though Tengen's immortality technique affected them, the effects of Tengen's assimilation with star plasma vessels did not. And this of course meant that as they slowly grew, the twins also slowly started evolving into something stuck between a human and a curse. In addition to this, the longer the pregnancy went on, on, the more deprived of sustenance the twins became, which was obviously not helped by Tengen's own ignorance of the fact that she was pregnant. And just as Sukuna says in chapter 257, he ended up devouring the other twin in the womb in order to survive. And it was then that Tengen learned she was pregnant. Tengen knew that if someone of her position was found carrying this curse of a child, then both herself and the child would face terrifying consequences. So once Tengen had worked out exactly why and how this 200 year pregnancy had occurred, she turned to the only person that that she thought would maybe be able to help her. She turned to her brother, also known as Kenjaku. And yes, I have decided that Tengen and Kenjaku were siblings because not only are they all friends from the same era, but they both have very similar techniques that are centered around prolonging the user's life. So I just thought it made sense. Anyway, Tengen told Kenjaku everything and asked for his help in delivering the child. Kenjaku agreed and through a combination of complex barrier techniques designed to separate the child from the effects of Tengen's immortality, the child was born. And simply, Put, it was just an abomination, with four arms, two mouths, and two faces, which were a result of consuming his twin and evolving into a part human, part cursed monster. Naturally, Kenjaku was intrigued by this new specimen, but made sure not to betray any sense of excitement while Tengen was present. Tengen knew that the child could not stay with her for both of their safety, so she forced Kenjaku into a binding vow. Tengen told Kenjaku that he must take the child deep into the Hida Mountains, far away from Jujutsu headquarters, and then stay with with him until he can fend for himself. Of course, she also ensured that Kenjaku would never speak a word of this to anyone. In exchange for fulfilling these requirements, Kenjaku then had a request of his own, which would make up his part of the binding vow. He requested to be given the soul of the other twin that Tengen had sealed within a complex barrier following labor, to which Tengen agreed. Just before leaving for the Hida Mountains though, Tengen stopped Kenjaku in order to say one final thing before shutting herself off from the world for good. She told Kenjaku that she wanted the boy to be 
be named Yuji, meaning brave. Kenjaku simply said nothing and then left with the monster child in his arms. He saw this child as nothing more than a step towards fulfilling his curiosity. And in Kenjaku's twisted mind, the name Yuji really did not fit this kid at all. So once reaching the caves buried deep within the Hida Mountains, he settled on the name Ryoman Sukuna, the two-faced spirit. <laughs> Kenjaku actually brought Sukuna to the very same cave that we see his original body mummified in during chapter 220. Even without the binding vow he made with Tengen though, Kenjaku would have ensured Sukuna's survival anyway, simply because of his own burning curiosity and the massive potential that he saw in this child. So Kenjaku made sure that the baby was fed and kept safe for around two years until he was able to move around by himself. Kenjaku knew that even if infant Sukuna was somehow able to remember him, by the time Sukuna grew up, Kenjaku would have already taken a new body. Despite taking this precaution though, after around two years, Kenjaku made sure to keep his distance and quietly watched over and protected Sukuna until he was able to fend for himself. At the age of four, Sukuna began wandering outside the safety of his cave, and Kenjaku watched from afar as the child mercilessly hunted down deer and foxes with his newly awakened technique, known to us as Shrine. It was at this point that Kenjaku was certain Sukuna could sustain himself, so he left without a trace in full confidence that they would one day meet again. And so, a four-year-old king of curses, who knew absolutely nothing other than the isolation of his cave, spent his days hunting and eating anything that moved. And yet his ever-growing appetite never quite seemed to be satisfied. <laughs> As the four-armed toddler Kuna went about his days hunting and feasting, he was completely unaware that just a few miles down the mountain, there was a little village. This snowy mountain village was inhabited by a small and peaceful community, a lot of whom were actually sorcerers. Now, the strongest and most respected warriors of the village all prided themselves on their fire-based curse techniques, which were perfect for combating the cold and defending the occupants from bears and other threats. One day, one of the main sorcerer families in the village who passed down this flame technique actually birthed a a child with frosty white hair, and they named this child Urame, the Frozen Star. At four years old, Urame awakened their ice-based curse technique when they accidentally froze over the village well. Now, since birth, the occupants of the village felt very uneasy around Urame, and their suspicions were confirmed when seeing their overwhelmingly strong ice powers. This ice technique was seen as a curse and a bad omen by the villagers, which led to Urame's parents keeping them locked inside for most of their days. When Urame was only six years old, they had a nightmare and woke up to find their sister half frozen to death next to them. Their sister survived, but Arame only became more and more neglected by their own family and began suppressing their technique for fear of accidentally hurting more people. Four years later, when Arame was 10 years old, the dam suppressing their powers finally burst. The constant abuse and neglect caused an overwhelming feeling of isolation and hatred to build up, and it eventually led to an outburst in which Arame accidentally killed both of their parents and their sister. As a result, result, the flame-wielding warriors of the village called for Arame's execution and began a hunt for the child who had fled into the mountains right after the incident. Cold, scared, and lonely, Arame ran for their life in the depths of the snowy Hida mountain forest. And that was when Arame stumbled across something very peculiar. <laughs> Once Arame was sure that the hunters had lost their trail, they settled down next to a mountain stream to drink when suddenly they felt an overwhelming presence behind them. On instinct, Arame reacted by completely encapsulating the strange forearm creature in ice. However, it merely took Sukuna a few seconds to completely melt the ice using the raw form of his furnace technique. It was the first time that anybody had ever walked away unscathed from the full power of Arame's ice, which obviously left them totally baffled. Before they had time to react, Sukuna knocked Arame out before dragging them back to his cave and dumping their unconscious body on a pile of old bones. After a few hours, Arame woke up, but instead of panicking, they simply remained as still as possible and observed the now 14-year-old Sukuna, who was eating raw deer meat next to his makeshift campfire. Despite the dangerous situation they were in, Arame could not help but feel an intense admiration for this creature. He was the first person Arame had ever met who was overwhelmingly stronger than themselves. Someone that Arame would never have to worry about accidentally hurting. Someone who had clearly experienced the same isolation for many years. Arame had also noticed that Sukuna had not seemed to figure out that he can actually cook his food on the fire. So when Sukuna went out hunting again later that day, Arame decided to cook the remaining scraps of deer meat instead of just taking their chance to escape. When Sukuna returned, he seemed totally unconcerned that Arame was sitting by his fire. He was a curious being who had no memories whatsoever of encountering another human before. 
before, let alone another sorcerer. So Arame simply handed him the cooked meat and Sukuna ate. Despite speaking no Japanese, Sukuna was smart. Smart enough to understand that the pleasure gained from Arame's cooking was not worth killing and eating them. Arame too understood, and with nowhere else to go, they chose to join Sukuna in his life of hunting, eating, and now cooking. Arame also understood that no matter how much they admired Sukuna's strength, Sukuna did not care for Arame for any reason other than their usefulness. But for Arame, that was good enough. And so for two more years, they remained living up in that same cave in the Hida Mountains until one day, everything changed. <laughs> When out hunting downstream, as Arame normally does, they were ambushed and captured by the elite warriors of their village. Before Arame had any chance to fight back though, a now 16 year old Ryoman Sukuna jumped from a mountain ledge and crushed two of the warriors under his weight alone. The others drew their flame coated swords, but Sukuna was levels faster and delivered fatal slices to most of the remaining sorcerers. There was one though, the village captain, who had managed to land a powerful blast of flames on Ryoman Sukuna. Sukuna looked at his burnt hand, which had blocked the flame, and he simply smiled. This was his first ever fight with trained sorcerers, and it brought him closer to satisfying his immense appetite than anything had ever done before. Once all the warriors were cut to pieces, Sukuna, who had learned Japanese over the last two years, commanded that Arame was to cook them. Arame obeyed, and so the King of Curses had developed a new desire for human flesh and the thrill of fighting with Jujutsu. Unable to go back to simply hunting animals, Arame and Sukuna finally left their cave behind and made for Arame's old village. And that's where they slaughtered the entire village and Arame then made a feast from all of their remains. Brutal, I know, but this is Sukuna we're talking about, remember? After only a few days spent in the village though, a troop of sorcerers with a very powerful presence actually arrived to confront them. The sorcerers said they were one of the Fujiwara squads that were sent by a higher up called the Teller in order to investigate the village and purge it of this curse. The sorcerers were significantly stronger and and faster than the village warriors and many did land blows on the young Sukuna, but eventually they were all slain by the king of curses. Once Sukuna had his fun with them, he commanded Arame to salvage the horse-drawn cart that they arrived in and then follow their residuals back to where they came from. So this pair of monsters left the mountains behind and headed for civilization, where they would seek out the strong and weak alike in order to further satisfy Sukuna's monstrous appetite. Over many years, Sukuna gained a country-wide reputation and secured him himself the title of the King of Curses. And yes, I am skipping over these events with a time skip because like I said, I am only covering specific plot points. I deliberately left the time in between alone so that I can make another part because this video is going to be long enough already. Anyway, moving on to the really cool bit. <laughs> So as the King of Curses went around building his reputation as the strongest sorcerer in history, the most evil sorcerer in history, known to us as Kenjaku, started putting his plan in motion from the shadows. After a long time carefully studying the soul of Sukuna's twin, Kenjaku managed to apply his barrier techniques and learn how to split the soul of a sorcerer and then seal it within a cursed object. After seeing how Sukuna evolved into a part cursed monster, Kenjaku was also curious what someone like Tengen would be like if she was allowed to fully evolve. And from Kenjaku's curiosity came an exciting new idea that he would come to call the Culling Games. Kenjaku's plan was very simple. Locate the strongest sorcerers throughout history and then convince them to become a cursed object after death in order to be reincarnated many years in the future to take part in this so-called Culling Games. The concept of Sukuna's evolution into a part cursed part human also inspired an idea in which Kenjaku wondered what would happen if a human and a curse mixed DNA. But he also decided that he shouldn't take on too much at once once and he should worry about that plan another time. Since Kenjaku was sure that most sorcerers would agree to the terms, he was faced with only one real issue. How would he make sure to locate all of these strong sorcerers over the years to come? Well, after some careful planning, Kenjaku devised a solution to his dilemma. He had heard tales of a Fujiwara clan higher up called the Teller, who had the ability to read the flow of cursed energy through time. The Fujiwara clan used this Teller to predict and locate potential new threats and cursed spirits before they happen, hence why the Fujiwara sorcerers knew to journey to the Hida Mountains. If Kenjaku could secure this sorcerer's body, he would be able to study the flow of cursed energy over the next thousand years and make note of all the times and locations where strong fluctuations occur. Kenjaku began his plan by putting steps in play to draw out and divide the Fujiwara's main fighting forces so that he could simply slip in and take the teller's body without needing to fight. He first decided to approach a young sorcerer called Yorozu and easily convinced her to become a cursed object after death. 
death. In exchange for this, Yorozu agreed to draw out and challenge one of the Fujiwara's main squads, known as the Five Void Generals. Around the same time, Kenjaku also orchestrated a mutiny within the Fujiwara's Sun, Moon, and Star squad. In secret, he ambushed and took the body of a sorcerer in the squad, and then turned on the other sorcerers by mercilessly slaughtering them. Kenjaku then used the squad's captain, Takaka Uro, as a scapegoat and ensured their execution. After once again changing bodies to avoid suspicion, Kenjaku approached the unsuspecting Uro with his reincarnation proposition, to which Uro obviously agreed. With Yorozu drawing out the Five Void Generals and the Sun, Moon, and Star squad in complete disarray, Kenjaku took his chance to slip into Fujiwara headquarters and steal the body of this so-called teller. Once he had slipped back into the shadows, Kenjaku then spent his years fine-tuning the technique and recording the flow of cursed energy through time. Despite observing a disappointing drop in average cursed energy after the Heian era, Kenjaku did detect multiple interesting fluctuations years in the future, with an especially interesting one occurring in around 600 years. What sealed the deal for Kenjaku though was an overwhelming shift in cursed energy detected roughly 1,000 years in the future. So, once Kenjaku had collected all of the information he needed, it was finally time for him to approach the King of Curses with his Culling Games proposition. When approached, Sukuna immediately took an interest in this mysterious man who claimed to be called Kenjaku. He could tell that Kenjaku was an immensely strong and skilled sorcerer, and yet his presence gave off no sense of hostility. Kenjaku decided honesty would be the best policy with Sukuna, so he told him about his body swapping curse technique and his proposal of Sukuna becoming a cursed object after death. As Kenjaku expected, Sukuna's initial reaction to the Culling Games plan was one of boredom and of caution. Sukuna was wary to agree and was unsure what Kenjaku really had had planned for the pieces of his soul that Kenjaku would obtain should Sukuna agree. The idea of being reincarnated again to fight sorcerers who were underwhelmingly weaker than him also seemed incredibly uninteresting to Sukuna. He then asked Kenjaku why someone as blatantly skilled as he was would take such a weak body. He also questioned what Kenjaku had to gain from the culling games as a whole. Kenjaku simply replied, saying that he was a curious observer wishing to push the limits of cursed energy, which was at least partly true. Kenjaku then revealed his final trump card and told Sukuna all about why his current body was so weak and about the foresight ability that it possessed. What Kenjaku said next is what sealed the deal for Sukuna and convinced him to agree to Kenjaku's terms. Kenjaku revealed to Sukuna a prophecy which he had come across while looking into the future of cursed energy. He had no details about their name, technique, or appearance. But all Kenjaku knew for sure was that in 1,000 years, there will be one born blessed enough to oppose even the king of curses a single sorcerer sent from heaven to earth that would shift the balance of the world forever. It was this prophecy from Kenjaku that turned Sukuna's caution and boredom into one of pure excitement. Even if it meant risking his soul in Kenjaku's hands, it was worth it for a chance to face the only sorcerer in 1,000 years who could possibly oppose him. Once the binding vow was made with Sukuna and Arame, Kenjaku then withdrew and allowed the rest of the Heian era to pass him by. In the year 1085, at the age of 112, which is the same chapter that Sukuna awakened in Shibuya, Ryom and Sukuna passed away and Kenjaku returned to claim his fingers as well as his mummified corpse. He kept some fingers for himself and then scattered the rest throughout Japan. Kenjaku then placed Sukuna's corpse in the very same cave that he brought Sukuna to as a baby up in the Hida Mountains. A hundred years after Sukuna's death, in the year 1185, the Heian era ended and the golden age of Jujutsu came to a close. Kenjaku, satisfied with his achievements, then started his thousand-year-long voyage throughout history. Once his long journey was finally reaching its finale though, Kenjaku put another plan in place to create a vessel capable of holding the deadly Ryoman Sukuna. Kenjaku turned the soul of Sukuna's twin into a cursed object, and then fed it to the unsuspecting husband of a woman whose body Kenjaku soon took for himself. Kenjaku then fell pregnant with their child and fed the baby one of Ryoman Sukuna's still sealed fingers. Holding the baby, Kenjaku deliberated on a name. Kenjaku then thought all the way back to that fateful day when Tengen handed him her cursed child and the final request that Tengen made. So Kenjaku looked at the child in his arms now and decided on the name Yuji. And well, you know the rest. So that does it for part one of my own Heian era flashbacks. Obviously, I know this won't be everyone's cup of tea and that is absolutely fine. After all, I am not Gege Akatami, but I did my best. Just a reminder though that I did this purely for fun and if you don't like it, you can simply choose to ignore it instead of throwing a 
tantrum like a toddler. Most of you guys are wonderful though, and criticism is always welcome, so make sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, congratulations to those of you who somehow made it all the way through the entire video. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe, feel free to join the Discord and follow me on Twitter, links below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in a bit. Okay.